Welcome back. We continue today with the description of fluid flow and we will cover in this the graphical description and the flow, fluid flow analysis. Graphical description of flows is important because our understanding of the complex motionless fluid is best obtained through it. It demonstrates fluid behavior and it helps us understand the geometry of flow and its spatial and temporal variations. There are a number of concepts in graphical description. One of the easiest one is the path line. The path line of fluid element A is simply the path it takes through space as a function of time. Consider a fluid element starting at R O at time t is equal to 0. As time proceeds, this particle moves. At any time t, its location R is given by R is equal to R naught. The original position at time t is equal to 0 plus integral of V dt from 0 to t. We have a number of particles. So, we have number of paths, one for each particle. In this picture, we are showing the waves in ocean. How are the particles moving? If we look at this, the particles are moving like this. On the top, you can see the wave motion, but we have marked a few particles with black dots and we can see their motion is strange. Let us look at two particles and their path is along two circles. So, the particles in this are moving purely in circular motion. So, paths of the particle are circular even though the waves appear to be traveling to the right. This is a time exposure picture of the same motion. Here a number of particles illuminated by a white light are captured moving in circles. The particle near the top are moving through circles of larger radius and particles near the bottom are moving through circles of smaller radius. This is of course, the Lagrangian concept as discussed in the last chapter. Lagrangian is the material description where we follow the particles and move along with them. Let us do an example sketch the path lines for a flow with velocity field v is equal to y i plus 3 fourth t j. The velocity d x by d t is equal to v x t, a vector equation. The two scalar components are d x by d t is equal to v x is equal to y and d y by d t which is v y is 3 fourth t, the j direction component of velocity. In the integration of this yields very easily y is equal to 3 by 8 t square plus a constant c 1 and x is equal to 1 8 t cube plus a constant c 3. We can plot this for given value of c 1 and c 2. We can plot these path lines for different values of c 1 and c 2. Here we are starting with five values of C 2 from minus 3 to 1 and value of C 1 as 0. The path of five particles are shown in this graph. Next we talk of a streak line. A streak line through a space point A is defined as the locus of all particles which have passed through the point A at any time between some starting time and the current time. Thus, 
the plume of smoke coming from a chimney is a streak line because every one of the smoke particle was at the mouth of the chimney at some time t earlier than the time at which this picture is taken. The streak lines that we saw in the Reynolds experiment are streak lines because all the particles are emitting from the same orifice of the jet. These are the streak lines of flow past an aerofoil. This model of the aerofoil is subject to a flow from the left to the right. At number of points upstream, we inject smoke. And so each one of these lines on the left is a streak line. And we see the streak lines do tell us how the flow is behaving. We see that the flow behind the aerofoil is kind of braided up into two braids of streak line, one at the top end, one at the bottom end. These we will learn later on are called the trailing vortices and are principally responsible for creating induced drag on this aerofoil. Here again is a picture where a delta wing is in a wind tunnel. The smoke is injected from the bottom and we can see how vortices are shed alternately from the two ends of the delta wing. You can see the power of visualizing the streak lines. They tell us the nature of the flow. Let us here do an example. Calculate the streak lines for the velocity field V is equal to sin T i plus j passing through the point 0, 0 starting at time t is equal to 0 and ending at time t is equal to 10 seconds. This is a little complicated problem. Every particle must pass through point 0, 0. So, the streak line at time t is equal to 10 seconds consists of the location of all the particles that pass through point 0, 0 between time t is equal to 0 and t is equal to 10 seconds. The particle at time t is equal to 10 seconds is still at point 0, 0 and the particle that pass through point 0, 0 at time t is equal to 0 second is at the top end of this streak line. So, the method of calculating the streak line is that we find the location of the particle at time t is equal to 0 which pass through the origin at a given time t prime between 0 and t. Then we find the current location of all these points. We first determine the equation for the path line using dx by dt is equal to vx which was sin t and dy by dt is equal to vy which was 1. The particle that starts from x0 and y0 at time t is equal to 0 by direct integration this gives x is equal to x0 minus cosine t plus 1 and y is equal to y0 plus t. The starting location at time t is equal to 0 of the particle which is at time t prime at x is equal to 0 and y is equal to 0 is given x naught is equal to cosine t prime minus 1 and y naught is equal to minus t prime because it was the x and y are 0 at time t is equal to t prime. So, we plug 
in the equations in line 1. And from this we obtain x naught is equal to cosine t prime and y naught is equal to minus t prime. These are the location at time t is equal to 0 for the particles which are at x is equal to 0 and y is equal to 0 at time t prime. The current location of these particles at time t are then found by these, these equations where we put these values of x naught and y naught to obtain the current location as x is equal to cosine t prime and y is equal to minus t prime plus t. These give the current location of all the particles which are at x is equal to 0 and y is equal to 0 at time between 0 and t which by definition is the streak line through 0, 0. So, we can find out the equation of streak line by eliminating t prime from this and if we do this eliminating t prime from the 2 we get x is equal to x prime plus cosine y prime minus t plus t minus cosine t and this streak line to origin at time t is equal to 10 seconds is obtained by plugging in the value of t as 10 to get this expression. This is plotted as this. So, the streak line for the given problem at time t is equal to 10 seconds which passes through point 0, 0 is this. The third important concept in graphical description of the flow is a streamline. Streamline is a trajectory of the velocity field much like the trajectory of a magnetic field or an electrical field. The local velocity vectors are tangent to a streamline throughout the flow field. In two dimensional flow then dy by dx the slope of the streamline at any given point would be vy by vx. Streamline is an Eulerian concept. It does not track particles. In a steady flow, path line, streak lines and streamlines are identical. But when the flow is unsteady, the could be very different. This picture shows the streamlines in a steady flow. In fact, these are streak lines. These are streak of smoke emitting from a rake to the left of this figure and flowing past an aerofoil. The flow is very well behaved. The flow is laminar, but these streak lines are also streamlines because the flow is steady. But if the flow is unsteady, then streamlines could be very different. The same flow we made unsteady by keeping the camera fixed and moving the aerofoil and if we see the velocities are tangent to these lines which is shown there. Let us do an example. Find the equation of the streamlines for the flow given by the velocity field v is equal to x into 3t plus 1 i plus 2y into j. As we know, the slope of a streamline in two dimensional flow is dy by dx is equal to vy by vx, and vy is 2y, and vx is x into 3t plus 1, 
And this differential equation is easily integrated to give y is equal to c a constant of integration into x raised to the power 2 divided by 3 t plus 1. I plotted the streamlines for two different times. You realize that this equation between y and x changes with time. The solid lines are streamlined at time t is equal to 3 seconds while the dashed lines show the streamlines at time t is equal to 6 seconds. As the time increases, the x component of velocity increases and so the streamlines are much flatter at a larger time than they are at a smaller time. Another associated concept is a stream tube. If we take a small circuit C within the flow field, then there is a streamline passing through every point of the circuit. And these streamlines would form a surface enclosing a small thin volume with a cross section equal to the circuit C at that location. This surface which consists of streamlines is called a stream surface and the volume enclosed by this closed surface is called the stream tube. Clearly, since the velocity is tangent to streamlines at all points, the velocity is tangent to stream surface at all points. This concept of stream tube we will use in a later chapter. As was said before, then there is steady flow, the stream lines, streak lines and path lines are identical. This picture shows a slender body in which smoke is being emitted through various orifices arranged in a line and we get a beautiful picture of vortex. The flow is steady, so these streak lines are also streamlines as well as path lines. Can two streamlines intersect? Suppose they intersect at a point P, then clearly the tangent to a streamline is in the direction of velocity. There are two directions of velocity at point P, one along one streamline and the other along the other streamline. Clearly that is not possible. The velocity can have only one direction. This is possible only if the velocity at point P is 0. In that case, there is no direction to a velocity and the two streamlines intersect. Such a point is a stagnation point where the fluid is stagnant. You see the streamline at the nose of this body is dividing into two portions, one going along the upper surface and the other along the lower surface. So, this point is clearly the stagnation point. The velocity at the left tip, the upstream tip of the aerofoil is clearly a stagnation point. Can path lines in intersect? Can streak line intersect? Yes, they can. Because if the two path lines intersecting, that does not mean the two particles are at that point of intersection at the same time. They could be at different times. So, path line and streak lines intersect when the flow is unsteady. They cannot do so in a steady flow because in steady flow, they would also be streamlines and the streamlines cannot intersect. 
Let us explain these differences between stream lines, path lines, and streak lines once again. Let us consider a point P in a flow field where the flow is from left to right. So, the streamline would look like these arrows, black arrows from left to right. A particle at P would travel along this line. A particle that follows will also travel along this line. So, this red line here would both be a streak line as well as path lines besides being streamlines as we started out with. Now, at time t is equal to t 0, the direction of the flow changes and now the flow is inclined at 45 degrees in that direction. In the, if everywhere the flow direction is same, then the current pattern of streamlines would be these dark black lines. But the particles which have passed through the point P up till time t is equal to t naught are still occupying this line. And, but now they start moving down in that direction. And so, what is the final position of the particles? Those particles which pass through point P up till time t is equal to t naught is this. And the particle which pass through point P after time t is equal to t naught are along that inclined green line. So, the green line is the streak line at this point of time. The green line is the streak line at this point of time. And what is the path line of the particle that started out first from point P? The path line is this blue line. They start from P horizontally and then take this 45 degree inclined line. So, the green line is an inclined L and pass lines are inclined L upside down. I hope this clarifies the differences between stream lines, path lines and streak lines. I invite you to watch this famous video by Professor S. Klein of Stanford University. This was made in 1960 and demonstrates the various flow visualization elements very beautifully. This video is available on YouTube and is also available on a site of MIT. I have given here the link. Let us next consider the rotation and distortion of fluid elements when it flows. Let a rectangular fluid element on the left inside a moving fluid move after a time delta t to the location shown on the right. As you see, it has changed its shape. Let us assume it is not rotating or deforming. Now, if we consider the left most lower edge of the fluid element, in time delta t, it would have moved at this u delta t. And the rightmost element on this line would have moved a distance u plus delta u by delta x into delta x times delta t. The velocity of the point on the right side is going to be little different from the velocity at the left end. 
and the velocity at the right end is found by Taylor's expansion. Clearly, this would mean that the horizontal line at the bottom of the fluid element is now stretched. This is the original size of the fluid element and this stretch is nothing but the difference of the two motions and that would be delta u by delta x into delta x times delta t. This is the stretch introduced. So, what is the strain introduced? Divided by delta x. And what is the rate of strain? Divide again by delta t. So, delta u by delta x is the rate of strain in the x direction, the linear strain rate in the x direction. Similarly, we can find in other directions. In the y direction, it will be dv by dy. And so, the volumetric strain rate in two dimensions would be the current volume which is 1 plus delta u by delta x into 1 plus delta v by delta y minus the original volume. And so, this is du by dx plus dv by dy. This is the volumetric strain rate. Now, if the fluid is incompressible, then delta u by delta x plus delta v by delta y should be 0. This is the famous continuity equation for incompressible flows that we will discuss in the next lecture. Let us further consider the rotation of this fluid element. Let this be a fluid element of size delta x and delta y at time t and after time delta t let the fluid element occupy this position. This element would translate also but they brought it back so that the left bottom point is coinciding. So, we removed the translation in x and y direction. We are worried only about rotation. The bottom rightmost point has moved up relative to its original position and that is because of the velocity gradient because the difference of v velocity in the x direction. So, this height in time delta t would be delta v by delta x into delta x by delta t and therefore, the angle through which the horizontal line rotates is dv by dx into delta t in time delta t. Similarly, the vertical line rotates counterclockwise by an amount minus delta u by delta y into delta t in time delta t. The average rotation of the element is obtained by taking the average of these two rotations and the rate of rotation of the element omega z is one half delta v by delta x minus delta u by delta y. Those of you who are familiar with vector calculus would recognize that delta v by delta x minus delta u by delta y is nothing but curl of velocity, del cross v vector. So, the rate of rotation omega z is one half of the curl of velocity. We will be using this fact later. 
this rotation of the fluid element curl of V which is twice the rate of rotation is also termed vorticity as a measure of rotation of the fluid element. Here we have shown a fluid element that rotates as it moves along its path line. The rotation is recognized by treating this fluid element or representing this fluid element with two lines crossing one another and one of the line carries an arrowhead. And so clearly we can see the particle is rotating as it moves along its path line. In a channel, if the upper plate is moving with the velocity v0 and the lower plate is stationary, we have seen earlier that there is a velocity profile. The velocity is large near the upper plate and it tapers down to zero velocity at the bottom plate. A rectangular fluid element is now distorted. Also, as seen by sequence of arrows on the top, the upper end of the vertical arrow is moving faster than the lower end. So, this arrow rotates clockwise. So, this flow is rotational. There is vorticity in the flow. The flow itself does not have to move along a circular or a curved streamline or a path line. The path lines are straight. The rotation here refers to the rotation of fluid elements about their own axis. It has nothing to do with rotating path lines. In fact, we can show and we will show later on that if the velocity is like k by r, the velocity in a free vortex or the velocity in a model hurricane or a tornado, the velocity decreases as r increases linearly and we can show that even though the particles are moving in circular path, each fluid element is not rotating. The two gray areas we have shown, the diagonals have the same orientation at two locations, signifying that the fluid is irrotational. There is no vorticity. This gadget is a vorticity meter which floats in water with its axis vertical. The two vanes at the bottom are driven by the angular velocities of two mutually perpendicular fluid lines. So the arrow at the top turns at a rate equal to the average of these two. That is with half the vertical component of vorticity of the lump of water in which the vanes are immersed. This tank has been on the turntable for a long time and viscosity has forced the water into a rigid body rotation. The vorticity float rotates almost exactly with the speed of the crossed white lines on the bottom of the tank. Sometimes the word rotation is used as a synonym for vorticity. But this does not mean that a flow has to be curved for vorticity to be present. Here, for instance, water flows in a straight channel. The streamlines are essentially straight and parallel to the side wall. But the arrow rotates, showing that vorticity is present. The same picture we can invoke to explain distortion. Here the x line, the horizontal line has rotated through the angle d v by dx into delta t, while 
a vertical line has rotated through an angle minus du by dy into delta t as explained before. The rotation of the fluid element was the average rotation. But what is the distortion? One side is moving counterclockwise, the other side is also moving counterclockwise. So, we can find the distortion, we can find the distortion by subtracting the two rotation and the rate of distortion per unit time is now given by one half of dv by dx plus du by dy. This rate of distortion is the shear straining and this shear straining causes shear stress. We had seen earlier when we had flow through a channel in which there was only one component of velocity u which was a function of y, the rate of strain, the rate of distortion was just du by dy. In two dimensional flow, this would be dv by dx plus du by dy. Let us now consider how do we analyze fluid flow. In solids as well as in fluids, the law of physics in the simplest forms apply to identified systems of matter. The law of conservation of mass, the momentum theorem, the law of conservation of energy are applicable only to a fixed and identified quantity of mass. But in fluid, as we have said before, we like to work with control volumes, with an Eulerian approach when we do not follow the material quantity. So, what do we do? It is impossible to keep track of the systems in many fluid problems or the boundary conditions are given an Eulerian description. We therefore prefer to work in Eulerian frame of reference. The laws are available in the Lagrangian frame of reference, so we need some tools to bridge the gap, i.e., work with the Eulerian description, yet use the laws available for systems or the Lagrangian description. System is a fixed mass of fluid its boundaries may change with time. In fluids, we work with control volumes. A control volume is a region in space. Mass can and usually does cross the boundaries of the volume. This control volume could also be moving in space could also be changing its volume, but it is a volume that we will consider. When we apply the physical laws, we need the rates of change of material properties associated with the system. All physical laws that are available to us use the rate of change of material systems, but in fluid mechanics, we deal with control volumes and the rate of change that we know are available for control volumes. So, we need a relation between Eulerian rate of change and the material rates of change. To obtain the relation, consider a control volume with one inlet and one outlet. In time delta t, a volume of the fluid moves into the control volume and the volume that moves in is V at the inlet times the area at the inlet times delta T. The mass that moves in is rho times the volume that, that moves in. And if 
the specific property that is the property associated with unit mass is eta then the quantity of the property that is moved in is rho v in a in into delta t times eta at the inlet. This is the quantity that moves in. Similarly, a quantity would move out at the outlet in association with the fluid that moves out of the control volume. The volume moving out of the control volume would be V out delta T times the area at the outlet and the property that moves in with this would be rho times eta times V at the outlet times A out the outlet times delta T. So that the change associated with the control volume would be delta n by delta t the rate at which the n contained the property n contained within the control volume changes times delta t is equal to dn by dt the material rate of chop property n associated with the volume of the control volume times delta t plus the property that is moving in minus the property that is moving out. And so, if we divide by delta t, we get this relation delta n by delta t is equal to dn by dt minus rho a v eta at the inlet minus rho a v eta at the outlet. This is the net influx of n and we can write this in the alternate form dn by dt is equal to del n by del t plus the net outflux of n. This is known as the Reynolds transport theorem and it is a very useful theorem for analyzing the fluid flows. The rate of change of physical quantity associated with the system, the control mass minus the rate at which it diffuses out of the system equals the rate of production of that quantity within that system. That is how we write the conservation laws. The rate of change of physical quantity associated with the system minus the rate at which it diffuses out of the system is equal to the material rate of the system of the quantity within the system which is also equal the rate of production of that quantity within the system. If that quantity were mass the rate of production of that quantity is 0. If that quantity was momentum the rate of production momentum is the net external force applied on the system. If the quantity was energy the rate of production of that quantity within the system is equal to the net rate at which the work is done on the system minus the net rate at which the heat is lost by the system. The rate of change of physical quantity associated with the system that is the control volume is equal to the rate of accumulation. plus the net efflux of the physical quantity and this we can write it like this. The rate of production of the quantity within the control volume minus the net convective efflux of physical quantity across the control surface is equal to the rate of change of physical quantity contained within the control volume. This is the local rate of change or the rate of accumulation minus the net diffusive flux of the control volume across the control surface. The first efflux which is the second term on the left is the physical quantity that moves out of the control volume in association with the mass crossing the boundaries of the system. 
while the diffuse flux which is the second quantity on the right is a quantity that crosses the control surface not in association with the mass but because of something like temperature difference the energy may be losing because of temperature difference diffusive loss mass is not lost diffusively momentum is not lost diffusively but the energy is lost diffusively we apply this to a system in which we have a container in which the mass is coming in at the rate m1 dot the mass is leaving at the rate m2 dot the control volume is defined as the volume enclosed by broken line the broken line itself represents the control surface the rate of production of the quantity within the control volume is obviously zero net convective flux of the physical quantity across the control surface convective across in association with the mass so m1 dot is moving m2 dot is moving out so m2 dot minus m1 dot is a net efflux and the rate of accumulation is dm by dt m capital m is the mass contained within the control volume the rate at which the mass contained within the control volume is changing is the rate of accumulation of mass and the diffusive flux is zero so clearly the rate of accumulation is the rate at which the mass is in flux into system thank you very much